coming today. We're really excited to have, um, this is actually our first speaker in the Sustainability Speaker Series of this semester. Um, we have Michael Martinez, who is the founder and executive director of LA Compost. Um, Michael, you're from Los Angeles. I am, right? yeah. So Michael is uh, born and bred in Los Angeles. Um, he spent some time as an elementary school teacher and about 10 years ago, um, came back to LA and wanted to do something about, um, about food waste and um, bringing people together. And we started LA Compost. Um, I met him a few years back, and uh, I think you may still have been in the phase when it was a bicycle collection. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> Collecting from people and using volunteers and bicycles to get food waste to composting sites. And um, now there are really large regional hubs around the city. Um, many people work for the organization. Um, it's really grown and been cool to see. Um, so he's going to talk about what he does and how he um, yeah. developed LA Compost. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you. Awesome. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really excited to be back on campus. Um, what I hope this talk kind of covers is a little bit of my background as a teacher, kind of how the seeds of LA Compost were planted on that elementary school campus, our early growth period of LA Compost, what we're doing now, and what's kind of in front of us. Uh, so. What was mentioned was I used to be a fifth grade reading and writing teacher, born and raised here in Los Angeles, specifically in the San Gabriel Valley, La Puente, Baldwin Park, um, east side of LA County. Uh, was a Teach for America teacher that was shipped to Miami, Florida for two years where I got to teach uh, in Little Haiti, which is off the 79th Causeway Bridge. I was really excited to go to Miami. I thought I was use my Spanish, get connected to more um, Latin America specific communities, only to find out that 97% of my students spoke Haiti. And Creole, and there was this real beautiful language barrier of one, I have to teach them how to read, and two, we can't like really communicate on the basic level. Um, it was really beautiful just to kind of allow these kids to construct their own knowledge, not just tell them how to think or how to repeat best after me, but really see how their imagination and creativity could be implemented and used in the classroom. Uh, so what we did was I used a lot of analogies and just symbols in my classroom and I would often carry a seed in my pocket and one day I pulled out a seed and I said, this seed is, is you. And they looked at me all weird and funny and confused and I said, well, let me explain. This seed needs a lot of resources pouring into it for it to become what it can be. It needs soil, it needs water, it needs sage, it needs sunlight, it needs healthy soil food web underneath it in the same way you need parents, community members, siblings, people pouring into you. And I said, in the same way the seed is going to face trials and tribulations along the way, whether it's things trying to uproot it, weeds trying to choke it, or other things trying to spray it, there's a lot of factors in our neighborhood that are going against your ability to thrive. The thing that I was trying to hit home in that seed analogy was that their growth and their ability to thrive wasn't just about them. In the same way a tree provides shelter, provides organic matter for the soil food web, provides food, um, their growth and potential was more beyond them. And I thought it was really vibing connecting with my students. You know, there were some nods, I was having some eye contact, and then one student raises his hand and says, so Mr. Martinez, um, so how do hot Cheetos grow? And um, I thought he was joking, but he was dead serious. And um, I was like, rather than like throwing him under the bus, let's, let's use it as a teachable moment. So I was like, well, let's unpack that and let's talk about where do carrots come from? And his response was, well, car carrots come from Publix. Um, Publix was a local grocery store in South Florida. And I said, cool, uh, where does Publix get it from? He's like, oh, from like the big truck that brings the carrots to Publix, of course. And I said, cool, well, where does the big truck get it from? And I knew that's kind of where it stopped for him. And rather than being embarrassed for not knowing the answer, it was kind of like defensive of like, well, I don't know, I'm not a farmer. Aren't you supposed to teach me how to read? And it was just like, okay. It was like a realization that everything that my students were consuming, everything that was surrounding them had an effect on their learning experience, just who they were. And 
it was an eye, it was somewhat of an awakening for me as far as like the level of disconnect, not just from food, because we all are disconnected from where our water comes from, where our food goes, but also to each other. So we started a small, unimpressive school garden. It was like six raised beds we got from like a $500 grant from a local organization. But what was incredible is we started this little garden club after school. It was like nine kids from my class. They had little badges with their names on it. They felt super proud to wear. It was like a laminated piece of paper. By like week four, we had like 60 kids showing up after school and like I couldn't recognize half the kids and for good reason because half of them weren't from the school apparently like my students were inviting their friends and family and cousins from like just the neighborhood which I guess was cool but what it allowed was for them to see that they were part of something bigger than themselves that they can contribute and had value and had a voice at the table and that they were constructing their own knowledge and understanding the full story of food not just garden or farm to table but what happens after that table experience and it was perfect in Miami where it, it is very sandy soil water drains extremely fast where the conversation of compost kind of came in uh, so we were composting on site the cafeteria staff was on board the nursing the nurse on staff was on board and this garden is still going to this day but LA has always been home for me um, I actually had the luxury of growing not too far from the Puente Hills landfill. Um, who here is from LA? Just out of curiosity. Cool. So, good amount. The Puente Hills landfill in Los Angeles County took a third of LA County's waste. Uh, 10.2 million people in LA, a lot of that waste going there. And just seeing that disconnect on a larger scale was, was also eye-opening. I also use the term of like my own history, like my grandfather was a carpenter, so he can look at scraps of wood and make it into something beautiful. My father for 40 years and to this day is an upholster, so he would take my brother and I and pick up like discarded furniture on the side of the road and make it like the centerpiece for someone's living room and now I see myself as a composter in the same way my grandfather used wood and my dad uses broken furniture I use food scraps and it's seeing the value in what we consider waste or no longer having purpose um, Moved back to Los Angeles, and as was mentioned, I started this bike collection model. It was a pilot program where I just asked all my friends and family who had bikes, I said, here's a trailer, here's a shirt, here's a website. We are gonna pick up as many food scraps as we can from restaurants, coffee shops, juice bars, etc." In about three months, we collect about 30,000 pounds of food scraps. Um, and I was just building compost bins in their backyards. I said, here's the basics of compost, air, water, carbon, nitrogen, thermophilic process. This is what you need. Here's what you do to troubleshoot. And it was great. The finished compost was given away at farmers markets. The donations we received from the farmers markets went to fund a, a elementary school garden at the very school I went to. So my teachers, kindergarten, first and second grade teachers were still at the school. I was able to kind of come full circle and build a garden there. And it was really awesome. We were getting like written in the times and had some good publicity and, and a lot of attention. But we also got a nice phone call from the state of California um, saying, hey, saw you guys in this publication, this article. What you're doing is awesome, but it's also illegal. Um, at the time, you were not allowed to move material from one point A to point B without a certified waste hauler's permit. There's exclusive rights to who owns trash. Um, and it was a very eye-opening experience of like, and the, the gentleman showed, was was very human about it. He was like, listen, off the record, what you're doing is awesome, but I unfortunately have to give these calls to lemonade stands and yard sales as well. It's just the compliance factor of it all. So I knew I wasn't going to just kind of like close shop because of that, but I also wanted to rethink how we were working. LA County, 10.2 million people from Catalina Island, which obviously the Wrigley Center is located, to Pomona. We are the most populous county in the country. Um, if LA County was its own state, we'd be the eighth most populous state. Um, so there's a lot of people that live here. And it's a lot of people that are drinking, eating, but also discarding materials daily. And unfortunately, where those discards go are in communities that don't often have the voice to push or allow for... What I'm trying to say is a lot of the discards in the waste industries is in disadvantaged communities, communities of color, communities that don't often have a say or input in like pushing it back. Um, and I think it feeds that disconnect of like, when we throw something away, we assume it goes away. 
But as we know, there's no such thing as a way, there's no such thing as waste just disappearing, it just leaves our zip code and goes to someone else's. So I think what was important for me is like, how do we engage the individual user in a more thoughtful and engaging way where we're not just collecting the materials on bike? Because I started this work in La Puente, West Covina, Baldwin Park, Covina, Walnut, but I was getting calls in like Venice and San Fernando Valley and Bell and I wasn't gonna ride my bike out there and it was a cute idea but really not scalable or engaging. So that's kind of when we shifted our model a bit. Um, if you think about this map, this is kind of where we are now. Um, these are all our locations throughout LA County and we kind of shifted how we do this work. And I'll go back to this picture, but I wanted people to really engage with that full spectrum and story of food. Gar garden or farm to table, table to compost, compost back to that growing source. So in 2014 is when we started our first community compost hub. And what this was, was the shift from just doing it on bike to doing it on site with the local community engaged. We got a grant from the local church. We converted an empty kind of sports graveyard into just like some 10 raised beds and a composting area. And the students, coincidentally enough, whose mother was the head of the cafeteria, would bring all the cafeteria material from the, from the, from the cafeteria on the school grounds, compost it on site. Anything that we grew from the garden, they gave away at the farmer's market down the street. And it was just this cool model of engaging with people. And our tagline early on was from waste to food, and people really didn't get that. But our tagline now is very simple or maybe very complex. It is soil and people. And the parallels between the two are very, very beautiful. Um, for those of you that have engaged with the compost pile, it's somewhat gospel-like or poetic or spiritual if you really dig deep, pun intended, in all sense of that word. It's taking what is considered broken, allowing the collective imperfections to come together to create something that eventually is whole and life-giving, selfless, and gives itself away. So for me, from like a community standpoint, it's like I don't think any of us in this room would claim per perfection. And sometimes I offend people by saying we are all broken in some capacity. Um, but it's the collective imperfections or collective brokenness of communities that allows this incredible transformation to take place beyond compost. I think what we get to do is, yes, divert millions of pounds of food scraps from landfills each year. Yes, engage people at the workshop level, but it's both affecting the soil and the soul in many ways of how we're doing this. Um, we had hubs at the Natural History Museum across the street. Uh, this was actually maybe at USC when we had a fair here. But essentially, we were growing these hubs since 2014 to about 2018 in schools, churches, museums, community gardens, housing projects, anywhere where there's food, people, and the ability to tell the full story of food on site. Uh, we were working with different agencies and organizations. Um, we were part of a food waste task force that the city put on. And and we were able to partner with California Conservation Corps as well as LA Community Garden Council. Um, going back to that map, the, the strength of our work is through the partnerships we've created. Every single location that we currently have today is in partnership with an existing organization that has already built a level of trust and transparency in the community. Um, so we don't own any land, we don't come into any space and say, hey, you need compost. It's always working alongside what's already taking place in that neighborhood in the same way compost applied to a tree or a garden or a landscape is adding value to what's already taking place there. So if you looked at this map on top of a map of LA, we have the west side of LA, the valley, downtown northeast LA, San Gabriel Valley south, southeast, and kind of downtown-ish and central. Um, I think what's been really awesome is this, uh, this idea of how do we go against the grain and shift the perception and understanding of how things should be. The way the waste industry works now is like we send things really far away, it's processed large scale, all the federal and state dollars go to large scale infrastructure, yet there's a way to think about it at the local level, at the individual user as well. And when I see this picture, I think of like a network, I think of the internet, I think of the complex freeway system of Los Angeles. But I think for me, it's like, how are we building a powerful, regenerative human network that the individual acts of the 10.2 million people have this really profound impact on the industry as well as the communities that they're engaged with? And I think that's our approach. I started this work by myself. We now have a staff of 15. 
those staff managed clusters of hubs in the areas where they were born and raised. I'm from LA, I can't claim every zip code of LA, nor would I feel comfortable trying to. So the staff that runs the South LA area is born and raised in this area. Staff that runs the West Side, born and raised in Santa Monica. I was finding myself on the freeway more than I was with the community, so it was really important for us to hire from within those communities, educate, train, equip, and empower them to be an extension of LA Compost and do that work. Um, we've continued to grow the hubs ever since, and this is kind of like a breakdown of what it looks like. Um, a, a, a hub is essentially a three-bin infrastructure, which I think we actually still have here on campus, um, but it allows for food scrap drop-off to take place. The City of Los Angeles really doesn't have a solution for organics. They're doing some pilot programs. Um, within LA County, there's some unincorporated cities that are doing some work. But what our hubs allow is for food scrap drop-off, kind of like in the same way you would drop off a library book or a video or anything like that, we create some level of convenience. Um, our community hubs and regional hubs, we'll, we'll talk about the distinction and, and, and difference in that in a sec, but they are essentially in spaces where people naturally gather. A lot of them are in community gardens, some in libraries and parks, but it's all about the locality and making this back of yard compost act more front of yard in your face and demystifying it along the way. Um, this is kind of what a community <laughs> hub looks like or how it looked back in the day and I'll show you how it looks like now. It's, as I mentioned, in partner with a partner organization. Can process about 10, 10 tons annually, um, serves about up to 100 people. Um, we're capturing metrics. It's more of like a self-serve station. There's like language appropriate signage that says, this is what we take, this is what we don't take, here's the process, weigh, record, deposit. And we've actually seen um, a huge increase in these hubs, so much so that we're kind of switching the model. In the same way we switched from bike to like compost hubs, we're in a place where rather than the majority of the work falling on the compost manager, we're creating more of a cooperative. So how that works and function is, it's a bigger bin, the lids are locked, and when in community members want to engage, they sign an agreement, uh, confirm that they are going to participate, and they have to fulfill X amount of volunteer hours, so it's a distributed kind of opportunity for the work to be done rather than the single individual to turn, sift water, etc. And it's been wonderful. Um, one example of the power of the cooperative was we had a we have a hub off of Spring Street, Spring Street Community Garden in downtown Los Angeles, and it's right pushed uh, alongside the wall of a parking structure. So I guess one late night, early morning, um, a driver either fell asleep or had a little bit too much to drink, ended up crashing outside of the parking structure from the second floor. It's a 200 foot garden and we only had nine feet of composting bin and of all the space they landed on our compost bin. Um, driver was okay, the compost bin was not. Um, we had to email the cooperative members and say like, hey, give us two weeks to fix, you know, this is what happened, it's not like we're just trying to give you the cold shoulder or turn our backs on you, a car landed on it, here's proof of picture to, to believe us. They weren't angry, but they were just like so like concerned that they couldn't compost their material for that two week period. So they like donated, they came to support the build out and the fixture and repair of it that it really showed the resiliency of each of these spaces in a really beautiful and positive way. I think what's also great about the compost hubs, it's unique to the location where it's located. So it's either under a bridge in downtown or off a beautiful mountain hillside in Topanga. It's engaging with the community that's there. Um, this one was also at a church in Monrovia and this is an open been, but I think what's really great about the community composting movement is that one, it's visual, two, you're engaging with the individual user, and three, rather than it being like a negative impact, it's actually a resource that the community wants in their neighborhood. Uh, when compost infrastructure is, is built, it takes about five years to get permitted, and that's just because of the environmental impact that it has on water, air, and just the local community we have kind of this advantage of working under this permitting threshold in the sense that we're not at the scale in which, which requires permits. So I think we can be a little scrappy and inoculate a lot of spaces that eventually have the collective capacity of one of those large infrastructures. And we're kind of taking that on right now as well. Um, this is a hub in Koreatown where it's kind of pretty much self-managed by the community. Uh, one in Pasadena, one in Highland Park, 
And now we kind of get into like what a regional hub looks like. Um, the difference between a community hub and a regional hub is capacity and LA Compost involvement. So this hub is actually at Fremont High School off of 79th and Avalon, so maybe about 12 minutes from where we're standing right now. Uh, this hub is really beautiful in the sense that they have a greenhouse, they have an orchard, they have a native garden, they're building a dental clinic, um, they have a health clinic, and then they have every other Wednesday a free farmer's market for the community. Um, as much as I will sing the praises of compost, I am a firm believer in looking at the highest value of food. Uh, the highest value of food, in my opinion, is in the mouth of someone who is hungry and can still eat it. Um, after that, of course, there's animals, of course, there's building soil, and then it goes to local, regional, and like far off levels. What's really beautiful about this space is it's, in, it's working with food recovery agencies. So food recovery agencies either get food from the downtown produce depot, they'll glean from, from fruit trees. This specific agency, Food Forward, gets a lot of material from the downtown produce hubs, um, as well as farmer's markets. So every other Wednesday, they create kind of like a farmer's market feel, rather than like, here's your bag of produce, thank you, they allow the residents residents to pick and choose what they would actually like to cook with rather than giving them a bag of like artichokes or eggplants or something that they're, it's kind of foreign to their cultural cuisine. Everything that rots or doesn't get consumed, the students process and compost between the orchard through a windrow. They then sift that material, apply that back on the garden as well as give that away. And it's kind of like this closed loop cycle that has taken place there. And it's been a model that other high schools would like to implement as well as other locations with space would like to intimate implement, but I just, I just love it because it's the soil, the people, the food, the education. It's, I'm a very firm believer that the learning is in the doing, and education really is only as strong as kind of like the access and opportunity you give the individual user to put what was learned into practice. Um, and maybe I say that as like a father of a three-year-old, uh, just like letting him do and, and learn and learn and make mistakes. Um, but I also, what I love about the regional hubs is that this is like a baby pile compared to where there are now. It's like you got mountains of compost in front of someone, you're adding thousands of pounds of food scraps, you're breaking it open with the pitchfork and seeing all this steam and the curiosity and the questions and, and all of these like aha moments take place for people. And one thing we're learning too is like, a lot of us have just forgotten how to work or maybe that's too harsh but like use a tool or be outside or sweat or listen to your body to know when to take a break but we get a bunch of groups whether it's like big corporate groups and there's just it's it's always so fascinating to see the response people have when they are reconnected to nature but I also like to remind people that like we're never not connected to nature because we are naturally part and our nature. So you don't have to be at a beautiful park or in the ocean or any, like we are nature as well. So I think the best thing that I see is like when there's a bunch of kids that come to our hubs and they're really overstimulated, they're on their screen all the time. I put a few hundred worms in their hand and there's kind of this beautiful malfunction that takes place. It's like a beautiful reminder of their humanity, a beautiful life transfer, a beautiful like recalibration of what it feels like to pause, to breathe, to look, to feel. And I think all of us need more of that. Uh, I think compost is the way we allow for that to happen. But the, the reason why we chose soil and people and the reason why I say there's a lot of disconnect is yeah, there's a lot of disconnect from like where our food goes, where it comes from, where our water comes from and all that, but despite the fact that we have 10 million people in our county, the level of isolation and disconnect that we have within each other, like within our communities and between each other is pretty high as well. We can live next to our neighbors for 30 years, not know them by name, go about just doing life in a box or in our isolated walking cubicle without ever connecting in a true or impactful way. And I think what this allows is for people to like not have to worry how they look. They can put their phones away. We'll snap a few photos so that they can post on whatever media or platform they'd like to do. But it's a real beautiful way to just inhale, exhale, and have that beautiful transfer with those people next to you. Um, the ability to coexist and coexist well with people who don't think, vote, or look like you is, is really perhaps rare to find nowadays. And 
I think what's beautiful about the compost pile is it really is that common denominator of the fact that we all eat, we all rely on the soil that feeds us, and that we all want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves, like my students in Miami did. It doesn't matter if you're 4 or 94, there's that itch and desire to kind of do more than what your own, which there's that itch and desire to just do more. Um, and I realize that this talk is probably going like this all over the place, but that's okay. Um, or maybe it's not, so I apologize. Going back to the regional compost hubs, I think what's really cool about this is their capacity. This specific site is at the Audubon Center at Debs Park in Northeast Los Angeles. It's in partnership with a nonprofit that focuses on establishing bird-friendly communities. At first, they kind of uh, were against the idea of doing composting on site. And then we kind of said that growing food for people is the same as growing food for birds. And that food is food is food. If there's life in the soil, there's life above the soil. If there's life above the soil, there's life in the air. And then they kind of clicked and they understood and now they're one of our biggest supporters. This specific site was taking 100% of organics from a nonprofit organization called LA Kitchen, which unfortunately is no longer around, but what was beautiful about that organization is they worked with, they had the tagline, which I love and wish I made it up, but uh, neither food or people should ever go to waste. And they worked with previously incarcerated individuals as well as the individuals who graduated from the foster care program put them in this training course to kind of get into the restaurant chef industry and all the materials and products that they were creating would go to agencies that were feeding food insecure individuals. All the material that they were using to create that food was imperfect produce. So there's a huge waste factor in this country, specifically California, just, be, just because carrots are hugging or a lemon is deformed or a tomato is shaped like a heart. There's this idea of perfection that we have of food that has really affected the industry. But LA Kitchen was buying all that imperfect produce, making these beautiful meals, and then we were composting it all on site. Um, I really get excited the more and more I see organizations that look beyond just like their profit line and look at how they are engaging the community, how are they creating more job opportunities, um, and how are they allowing people to be like the best version of themselves. Um, this is what a typical Tuesday or Saturday looks like at our hubs. Literally just people, we have music blasting, turning compost, steaming. The pile gets about 140, 160 degrees. And I've always thought it'd be really cool to like have a potluck and then when it's time to eat, pull out like a big stew or soup out of the compost pile to see like if one people would eat it, but two, that it truly is the embodiment of connecting people over food. Um, Last year we had what we called this learn shop on Earth Day and we allowed family members, students, interns, volunteers, anyone from the community kind of see the full spectrum of our offerings. We do composting with worms, so this is like a vermicompost flow through system. Essentially how it functions is you would feed the top, there's a cutting bar that cuts the castings, which is just the worm poop, at about four inches. It doesn't harm any of the worms because they're dealing with the, the material on top. We had a sifting station, we had a lab station, we had the ability for students to kind of see each section of the pile, but really making the practice practice of compost normal, uh, something that wasn't foreign, something that they can actually do on their own as well. Um, yeah, sifting stations, engaging people, allowing them to really get their hands dirty. This is one really exciting location. This is at uh, a location in Panorama City. It's called Cottonwood Urban Farms and our partner Elliot here owns the property. It's kind of nestled as you can see all with residential units all around him. Um, several people have been trying to purchase this property. That cottonwood tree is about a hundred year old, hundred years old. And there was a natural watershed that kind of flowed through his property so his soil is really beautiful. Um, What's interesting about the valley is the valley is one of the areas in Los Angeles where there's a high concentration of the waste industry. So the way that waste works is when we throw something away, it's collected by a hauler, it's taken to a MRF or source separating station where they kind of separate the valued goods or what's going to be landfilled, and then it travels to its final destination. Um, how many of us are aware of kind of like the recycling industry or the lack of recycling industry now? Wonderful. Uh, for those of you that didn't raise your hands, we used to export a lot of our plastics, cardboards, and things that had value to other countries. A lot of those things kind of just shut down because we were essentially exporting our trash. Now we're kind of having to deal with our own stuff. And because we've kind of 
depleted the industry that we had here in the States. A lot of this material is piling up in warehouses, parking lots, and just going to landfill. So I think it's exciting that, the, that Catalina Island and the Wrigley Center is starting to think about like how do we create on-site solutions that allow for us to also apply those in areas where we naturally do life. So this site right here was working with a food recovery agency called MEND, Meet Every Need with Dignity. Again, a ton of the food scraps that weren't consumed or given out to the community, we would compost on site. You can kind of see a, a small little picture of this in the corner. We piloted a new form of composting called aerated static piles, which was like forced air. Compost is air, water, carbon, and nitrogen in different balances. Rather than turning the pile every other day, we put a solar panel, a jumpy house blower, and PVC piping on the bottom so it would turn on every other day for about 30 minutes and it would force air through the pile, which required us to never have to turn the pile. We would essentially layer water and set it and forget it and over within a month we can kind of sift out that. That was a really interesting model that I'd like to continue. That's the way some large scale industries kind of implement the composting practice. Um, my only fear about doing too much technology or just kind of pressing a button is is taking away the opportunity for people to really engage with it fully. Um, this is more people sifting at a sifting station. It's, it's really incredible like if you just create an opportunity and a space for people to show up and come and have little training or experience but just be present like they will show up. And we're seeing that across the county. We literally have open hours. People want to just sift. They want to talk. They want to turn. They want to feel connected to something and feel like they're contributing to something. And it's really exciting that we're able to provide them with those, those spaces. Um, we were part of City Hall's Food Waste Task Force through the Board of Public Works. And they wanted to talk about, well, what is the actual capacity or opportunity for community composting? Because we only have 160 gardens or 250 countywide, and we only have so much parks so we're like well how do we like think of space different so this does not include vacant lots this does not include parking lots this does not include a lot of these other areas that we can look at this is solely parks school gardens farmers markets nurseries and like parklets throughout LA County um, and they're kind of sprinkled all throughout there's obviously some areas where there's still a lack of those types of nurseries farmers markets etc but you start to think about what that network could look like if we start to build that decentralized local infrastructure in a way that is closer to the source of consumption or use of that food. So our goal is if someone buys, eats, and consumes food there, they can also build that soil there and, and it's kind of like that natural closed loop system. When a tree drops its leaves, it doesn't ask us to rake it or put it in a bag and ship it far away. It knows what it's doing. It's allowing that organic matter to feed that soil food web at its at the root zone um, so I think we can learn a lot from nature I think we can learn a lot from each other um, and I think that we can learn a lot by just doing I think there's one thing about reading and, and watching videos and feeling extremely confident but I think the reason I'm even up here and get to talk to you all is just because like my collective failures have allowed me to learn what not to do um, the same organization that's called us seven, eight years ago saying, hey, what you're doing is illegal, visited our sites three months ago because of how impressed they were of our growth and have now created a, a grant fund for this work for over a million dollars that's coming out in April. And to me, it's that the same people that think you're crazy are the same people that are going to be singing your praises in, in, in due time. So I think, I think it's okay to take risks. I think it's okay to, to be afraid of like the unknowns, but I went to undergraduate APU, I came here for graduate school and education, all my peers were teachers and principals and superintendents and I think comparison is really toxic because I was like, ah, they're so far along in their careers and I'm still trying to figure out this compost organization. But I think to find success for yourself, I think don't worry about what other people are doing and kind of measuring your journey to theirs because if all we focused on was everyone else, you're never pouring or watering your own roots or, or, or focusing on your own growth. And I think that was really important for me. Um, and now as I get to reflect, I'm really proud of like those slow phases or those times of uncertainty. Uh, a few months ago, Mayor Garcetti came out with the Green New Deal. This deal as far as 
how do we make Los Angeles a model city for the world, not just the country? And under Waste and Recovery, we were listed as like the top key partner. Um, and the very pilot programs that we created, the city wants to implement citywide. Establish food scrap drop-off locations at all city farmers markets. Hmm, where they, I wonder where they got that idea from. Uh, launch citywide residential food scrap collection by expanding and developing a compost master plan focused on community and regional compost infrastructure. Verbatim off the website. And it's really beautiful now to have a document to like have some leverage. So when we go into meetings or when we are speaking to stakeholders, there's long-term goals and visions and we are included in those goals. And this all kind of came from an idea of like one, how does a hot Cheeto grow, to two, making a little school garden, to three, starting it on bikes, to like, there's a reason why I started in my hometown because I knew I could fail, fail there a lot and people would have grace and compassion to, to still help me. One nice example is as I was picking up 100 gallons of carrot pulp from Jamba Juice, I made a sharp turn in an intersection and all that pulp fell in the middle of the road just blanketed with like orange and yellows and greens of pulp and people are pulling over and they're like, what are you doing? And like confused and it was like a perfect opportunity to be like, let me tell you about compost, you know, <laughs> as I'm like scraping up the sidewalk. But I want to encourage you to know that like there's people supporting you. I think when we started this work, there was about 10 to 15 community composters around the country. Now there's close to 350 all doing various models of bike powered collection, um, farmers market collection. There's cities like New York that have been doing this for 25 years, where across all five boroughs you can drop off food scraps at the farmers markets, rather than shipping it to Baltimore like they were doing in the Bass. They're, they're thinking of local infrastructure as well. I think is as complex as LA's problems are, we have the ability to create some really innovative solutions. Um, we have the luxury of I always say that the, the beauty of a compost pile comes from the diversity of its ingredients, and I think that the beauty of Los Angeles comes from the people who call it home, or even if it's a temporary home. I think, not to get all far off, but it, if LA was a compost pile, we are the ingredients of that pile that make it what it is. And I think the diversity, the experience, the ideas, the care, the passion that we all collectively have across all 88 zip codes in LA County have the ability to really show the world that, you know, it's one, okay to think different, and two, the strength of this work comes from the small acts of people doing really profound things. It's kind of like the bug's life mantra of the ants realizing that, you know what, there's a lot of us and only seven crickets. And within this infrastructure or the way things have, have, have been growing, it's, it's really good just to think different. This is one of my favorite hubs. This is in a housing project on the west side. These mothers and a few fathers were tired of HACLA, the agency spraying chemicals on their little trees or what they were trying to grow. They were chopping them down. So they built a little community garden, a few raised beds, fenced it. They have parties, meetings, gatherings, they're composting on site. But beyond that, they changed the law. They gathered, they organized, they worked with other housing agencies, and they changed the law of how they can actually grow within their own footprint of a housing complex. Uh, I love this picture as well. This kind of embodies the intergenerational approach of our work as far as it doesn't matter how you look or how old you may be, there's an opportunity for you to engage with this work. Whether it's like holding it down with a machete like this individual's doing or just chopping it away with a spade shovel. Um, and another thing going back to it is one kind of campaign that I've started to do is this, it's called Composters of LA. And I essentially, when I come across volunteers or people who engage with this work, I snap a portrait photo of them. I ask them for their zip code and I ask them for oh, one response as to why compost. And I think to me those responses show the beautiful diversity of people's feelings as to why they engage with this work. Some people are really smart and uh, respond, well, why not? <laughs> and like laugh and walk away. And other people give like really thoughtful like thesis statements as to why compost. But I think maybe it's because I'm from here, maybe it's because I have like deep roots in LA, but you can experience the breath and beauty of LA on a layover or 
in a short time. The beauty of LA comes from the neighborhoods that make the city, the people that live in those neighborhoods, the people that call the city home. And I think, to me, it's like a beautiful representation of the compost pile in that these ingredients are resilient, they are powerful, and if you allow them to do something great and provide them with the space and opportunity to do so, they will blow you away. And I think, I think that's what we're itching more for. I think whether you want to get into compost or whatever you want to do after your time here, I think we all want to be the best version of ourselves. And sometimes that takes a lot longer to figure out, and that's okay, because your timeline is your timeline. But I think for all of us, it's like, there's a strong connection in doing something with someone that just doesn't benefit you, but benefits like beyond your circle. Um, I would say this is the strength of LA Compost. Uh, this is my team. Uh, for the most part, almost all of them, if not all of them, are born and raised in LA, except for like one who's from Canada. Um, but yeah, they represent a different region of Los Angeles. They each have their own story. They each bring their individual genius to this work. And I think it's really exciting to know that like in the past, when an opportunity like this came up where we had to speak on LA Compost, it was always Michael Martinez. It's nice to know that LA Compost does not equate to Michael Martinez anymore. I can turn a pile or show up at a volunteer and it's like, I'm just another human being. And it's, I'm part of this beautiful human network that we're growing and allowing to really thrive. I think for us, what's really exciting is the opportunities we have on the horizon. We really allowed for that state funding to come on board. We're written in the Mayor's Green New Deal. A lot of farmers markets want us to do this farmers market food scrap drop off and collection. But I think what's also encouraging is kind of like the parks and reinventing the green spaces. We just got the green light at Griffith Park, which is one of the largest urban parks in the country. Um, Central Park in New York, anyone ever been there? 800 acres, pretty big. Anyone want to take a stab at how many acres Griffith Park is? Hint, it's bigger. 4,000. 4,000 acres of green space. And now it's not going to all be compost, I wish. But as we start to talk about regenerative agriculture, carbon sequestration, water retention, stormwater treatment, nutrient-dense food, and the many co-benefits that compost has, you start to think about these beautiful inoculated carbon sinks that were created in backyards, in large parks, in schools, in churches, museums, and housing projects. Um, whether you compost on your own, it might be hard here in the dorm creating different solutions. I think for the reminder and the encouragement, it's like it's that soil in people. It's not just the act of growing food or the act of diverting waste. It's seeing things different. It's understanding that we're all going through something and the collective sacred act of compost really allows us to understand that wholeness is only achieved through this. Um, that is our website handle. That is my contact information. Um, if you ever want to reach out, if you have any questions, you ever want to volunteer, you ever want to turn a pile. Um, we work with a lot of partner organizations here and around campus. We, early on, USC was one of our hubs and still kind of is, I guess. We haven't touched it in a while. Um, we have something across the street at the Natural History Museum, but uh, from the professors here, establishing good connections to what's potential at the Wrigley Center, like, I'm just really encouraged for what's possible because there's laws that are passing. AB 1826, 1383, like all these laws that are going to require food scrap collection, compost, and people are kind of scrambling, one, to want to have their material picked up, but then the receiver is scrambling because there's nowhere to take it or infrastructure to process it. So I think we're in a really exciting time to build some new systems, new designs, and innovative ways to approach this, this opportunity, not so much problem. Um, so yeah, that's my talk. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, I, it was 45 minutes and allowed for 15 minutes of questions, so is that, is that the way we wanted it to happen? Yeah. Questions? <laughs> How often do you do community events like that where you can come in and, and help? 
help out? Is that like a weekly or a monthly? Or They're weekly? pretty, pretty odd. I would say there's like a few happening a week in different areas of Los Angeles. Um, always something on the weekend, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and then what's difficult about the weekdays is like they're, they kind of happen during the nine to five. So we often get a lot of students or artists or people that don't work within that typical window. Um, but we always have something during the week. I think the only day we're not doing something is like Monday. But every day of the week, at some point, or some space in the city, we're actively doing something. Um, that was a great talk. Thank Thanks. You. Um, I was wondering, um, so for the different hubs and how you receive food, um, I, I guess how, how does that process uh, work? Is it different for different hubs, like where the sources come from? Yeah. Timing. Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, Sorry to. For Griffith Park, for example, like what's, I guess it's. Yeah. Kind of so each hub is unique in regards to its access and points of engagement. There's some hubs that are 24 7. There's some hubs that require a lock combo to access. There's some hubs that are just open hours, that a few times during the week, there's open hours for you to kind of come. Um, we're kind of moving towards, at the community level at least, to be more of a cooperative. So there are more 24 7 hubs, more combo code, but there's a level of engagement that takes place from the individual drop off point. At the regional hubs like Griffith Park and stuff, we'll, we'll bake in some like community drop-offs, but majority of those park models are going to be directly attached to both restaurants as well as farmers market pickups. So for instance, like we have a farmers market every Sunday that works with over 300 families, collects about 3,500 pounds a Sunday, and all that goes two miles away rather than 200 miles away to a park where it's processed. And what's really cool is like the user experience and the level of engagement. So maybe you saw us on Instagram, our website, like, cool, I'm going to drop off, see how that is. Freeze your food scraps, bless you. You bring it, you drop off, and you're like, hey, how can I help? Hey, why don't one of these weeks you come on this side of the table and kind of talk about your experience? Those people volunteer and they're like, hey, how can I do more? Hey, why don't you come on a Tuesday or on a Saturday and turn the pile? And it's really beautiful to see how plugged in they get to the point of like they don't even drop off anymore We're like hey whatever happened to so-and-so it's like oh I started doing it on my own I, I realized how easy it was you know so it was this level of engagement slash release of control but to answer your question every hub is kind of unique to yeah. the space where it's located yeah no it's great the the social component is so massive oh. that's what makes it truly regenerative um, and then just second question if I could for the restaurant portions and from like commercial establishments as has there been a strategy or plan for who, how transportation is going to work? Like the restaurants pick up that bill or yeah. the farmers market pick, pick up that bill? So the one thing that we're trying to be thoughtful of is like how do we one, not add more vehicles to the road? So we've been thoughtful about even with the farmers market model, and I'll get to your restaurant point, Farmers are coming down to Los Angeles for either one day or several days for several markets, and they're often going back to their farm with empty trucks. So really thinking about how do we backhaul some materials back to their farm where they have space, where there's not real policies pushing back, and we can start building the soil that is growing the food that they're actually selling. So there's that mode. There's also opportunities to work directly with the hauler. Um, City of LA specifically is in this contract called Recicla, where it's an exclusive franchise agreement where certain haulers actually have ownership of the material. Um, other parts of the country, it's kind of free for all. LA and California is kind of really strict. Um, we are working with some micro haulers that are navigating areas outside of LA's limits, whether it's Altadena, Palisades, Malibu, et cetera. And they are hauling in their own vehicles and we are processing their, their material at our local hubs. But transportation and movement of material is really interesting. We specifically have a sprinter van where we load all the material in 27 gallon totes, stack, 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 take it two, two miles down the street and, and kind of compost. But the less we're on the road, the better. And then there's other, Entities like there's this company called Angel City Lumber and they essentially work with all the trees that fall down in someone's backyard on the freeway on the sidewalks and rather than all those trees just getting milled and shipped to the trash they're making beautiful furniture chairs bus stops hardwood floors they create 20 yards of sawdust a month it's a lot of material so what we're going to do is we're going to start picking up that sawdust every week and distributing it across our hubs as that carbon material so instead of them paying a few thousand dollars to dump it we had the hauler buy us a vehicle to then distribute that and see it as a resource. So every, every situation is kind of specific because it's so hard to fine tune a universal model in LA, LA County, because there's so many different municipalities and stakeholders and people in position of power to make those decisions. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just curious, once you found out that it was illegal to move trash around, 
Um, what steps did you have to take for it to become legal, and how long did that take you? Yeah, so once they said, hey, what you're doing is illegal, it was more of like, okay, well, <laughs> are they going to come down and shut me down? Probably not. Um, what we did is like really thought about like, all right, let's look at the policy. Let's see what the policy says and how it reads. And a lot of it, there was some loopholes in regards to like gray areas of like, if it was in vessel, if you do it with worms, if you do it on site, well, what is on site? Because if I'm at Griffith Park, that's 4,000 acres. Like if I do some over here and some over there, am I on site or like multi? So it was just engaging the, those that wrote the policy and then them coming to the conclusion that like, well, where'd these numbers come from? Where'd this policy come from? So it, it took a few years, to be honest, and there's still some regulations on how material is moved. Um, specifically, like if I wanted to start hauling some stuff, it would be hard to start charging restaurants to do that within a Recycla franchise zone. If I wanted to do that at the residential level, there's more flexibility because the city doesn't have a program in place. Um, but it took about two to three years of just like engaging, going to like Sacramento, going to like making online comments. And at the end of the day, I realized they would only be concerned about what you were doing if they were receiving complaints. And a lot of what we were doing is just like, how do we uphold best management practices? How do we work with local enforcement agencies to actually have them come turn in our piles and like see what we're doing is like right next to someone's house and people smell with their eyes. So if it, it looks like a pile of mulch or a pile of twigs, then that's what it looks like. But if it's infested with rats, raccoons, possums, and everything else in between, then people will complain. And we've had some other friends who've been doing this for a while get some complaints just because of what it's visually become. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like you're dealing with people on every level, from policymakers to city you know, implementers. And, but it did take time. Um, and when we stopped doing it on bike is when we kind of shifted to like the on-site model. And then from that on-site model, we grew. And when the farmer's market opportunity came up, which did ask us to move material, that came from the city's request. So, if anyone was going to get us in trouble, we're like, well, the very city that would slap our hand is the one that asked us to do it. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that was a perfect answer, but That's great. yeah. Thank you. Hi, thank you for coming out today. Yeah, I'm sure everyone appreciates it. Um, I don't know if you touched on it, but you like USC doesn't compost right now. Um, allegedly, the dining halls compost um, based on their website. They don't provide any information. But if USC or um, organizations around USC wanted to, like Greek Life, for example, wanted to compost, what do you think the timeline and like the amount of infrastructure would need to take place in order for it to not only be viable, because LA doesn't really compost right now, but also be cost effective? Because everyone's trying to save money, and that's a big issue right. um, when thinking about compost. Yeah, and I think, one, thank you for that question because it's, it's true, right? Like, even when people want to do this, it's really expensive or there's no space capacity or education or that allows them to engage with it. And I think, one, it's looking at the true costs, not just financially, but like from environment, from like footprint, carbon footprint, et cetera, and like seeing all the options that are on the table, right? Because the way we compost is like very much open air, piles, worms, et cetera. But there is some innovative, like in-vessel systems that are more appropriate for a campus. Um, so one, I would look at what that true cost is. How much does it cost us to get rid of this material? Where does it go? How far does it travel? So let's look at both the financial cost and the environmental impact. And then based on what we're paying, how do we create a solution within that budget or framework? So Marin perhaps save money. Two, the finished compost could be kept on campus or given to the community's green spaces. And three, figure out a system that as students switch every four years, there's an opportunity for some sort of training to take place so that as perhaps you lead a hall, you can carry that on and pass it on. So I would look at the different systems, I would look at the cost, look at the true cost, but understand that like it's possible. You know, there's models and universities that are doing this. Think that comes to mind is space too, you know? Um, and how we, how we value space, how we look at space, and, and where that space exists. Like we've gotten requests from students here as about a, a week ago from the farmer's market that takes place here on campus. And they saw that we were doing the farmer's market. They're like, hey, can we do a farmer's market here on campus? And I'd always love to just say yes to every opportunity, but the first thing that I thought of was like, well, where does this go? 
you know, I'm like, I don't want it to travel far away. How do I keep it within somewhat of a five mile radius? And it's, it's really putting all the opportunities and options on the table. And not it just being my decision, but actually having it be a collective conversation as well. Yeah. Okay, so it's like, it's plausible. Yes. Okay, because I think for something like our row, every house like obviously goes through a lot of food, but it's not like I think that people have the time or the capacity to say like, I want to work with you to create a system. It's more like I want to give you a budget and hopefully you can do it. Right. You know what I mean? So do you think that infrastructure is coming? I think, I think it's on the horizon, one partially because it has to. It's like, yeah. it's the law. And although, do you have a comment or question? Or? Um, yeah, just a comment on this point. The residential education, aka the dorms on campus, are actually starting to compost. Um, so the infrastructure, like they, USC has figured it out to some degree already. Um, the apartments that are university housing aren't composting, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me, because the freshman dorms are and they don't have kitchens. But there's a survey that um, students can take and pretty much just request that the, um, like I believe it's the janitors that are like, involved in the maintenance and like taking out the topics. But essentially that survey would request that that, um, that process takes place in the, uh, the apartments as well. Yeah, and I know we're, we're not trying to start a debate or anything. But like when I, like that's obviously a really good idea. I'm saying like, we need that system. We wouldn't need that system already in place because, you know, you don't obviously like one. You don't know what you want until you, you have it. You have, it's in front of you. So it's like a lot of people from California. They don't know what compost is, so they wouldn't know to request that. And then it rel then that comes to like the people who are like greener to do all the work. And that shouldn't be. I don't want to. Maybe they want to do the work. I don't want to, but <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, that's good. Um, I was just going to also make a comment. Um, I run the gardening club on campus, um, which is where I believe the hub was started. It kind of was Parkside? Uh, and we've been picking it back up recently. Um, so we actually like accept students' compost if you like want to bring your compost to the U.S. Um, our biggest issue has just been like getting people to actually help process it, because there's only about like, five of us who like, every week process it ourselves. Um, but we are like trying to pick that back up. I just wanted to like, let people know the resources. One last question. Um, so the bills that you uh, mentioned, um, they require a certain percentage of uh, food to be recycled or composted from commercial establishments. Uh, yes. Does this um, does this apply as a commercial establishment? I would say it does. And so I guess my question is... There's also no form of enforcement at the moment. So it's like there's no so, compliance. Of course. But there's no actual support from the government to actually... Enforce. It's the ban without a plan in many ways, right? It's like, everyone has to compost. How do we do it? Yeah. You know? Yeah, because we're trying to do it with restaurants right now in Santa Monica, and we're just telling them they're illegal. But there's no one that's going to really come out. Come out yeah. Right. Um, so... This is a, you talked a lot about the people, and um, I'm sort of wondering if you can tell us a little bit about um, like the funding model for making this a sustainable organization. Yeah, yeah, so the first five years was very much, uh, I call those years the side hustle because it was where I had to work multiple jobs to kind of keep this going. and. Although we started like 2011, 12, 13, it really didn't start until like 2017 from like, I was able to hire myself. Um, but we are very foundation heavy, which is something I don't want to be the case for long term because nonprofits are all asking for the same money from the same funders. We are very much in a phase this year and next year of developing a, more of a social enterprise that has some income generating opportunities that support and subsidi like subsidize the free program that we allow. Um, but yeah, from 2017 to now, we've been doubling our budget every year. More 
it's, it's, int it's funny because when we started foundations like, ooh, compost, what's that? Like, that's risky. I'm not going to give to that. And then like Patagonia and a few others gave and that was like the first domino that fell and then it hit more dominoes and more dominoes. Um, so I would say the majority of our fund is about 85% foundations, about 10% contracts, and then 5% like individual giving. Um, so we definitely want to diversify that pie. Um, but it's exciting to see that like, we are getting contracts to even teach workshops at different cities. Um, and then the premium we get for those workshops, we then get to do for free in different work and, and neighborhoods as well. We actually haven't really been selling the compost at our regional hubs, which has been in huge demand. So it's a matter of taking the time to like identify what that true cost is. How do we make it equitable for all parties involved so that if you didn't have the money, maybe you sift or put in some work to get it. Um, I think we are one of the few nonprofits doing community compost. Most community composts across the country are businesses and are just doing, they haul, they pick up, and then they drop off somewhere else, and then just haul, pick up. What For us, it's like we want that social human element a little bit more. But um, yes, nonprofit, very foundation heavy, weaning off of that model very soon. Yeah. Wonderful. So let's thank Michael. Yeah, thank you. Everyone.